So for naive B cell activation, this is very similar to what we saw with naive T cell activation, in which we had to have a secondary signal in, in the naive T cells context as the CD28 uh, B7 ligation. But in this context, we have the naive B cells, which usually is going to involve not only just the receptor interacting with its ligand, but some type of a secondary signal, right? The co-receptor, the pattern recognition uh, receptors, or in most contexts, T cell help, or even other cell helps that we're just now uh, starting to learn about and just now having research done about this stuff. So the first step that's required, and this is the one that you can't avoid, is cross-linking and clustering of the surface immunoglobulin. The signal is not able to, I guess, go from point to point in this in terms of like the transduction pathway if we don't have close proximity, if we don't have clustering of our B cell receptors. And that's what this picture over here is showing us is a clustering of antigen receptors allows the associated kinases to phosphorylate the ITAMs of the Ig alpha and beta, specifically the ITAMs in the cytoplasmic domain. Um, I don't think that it's really important that you understand these things are known as SARC family kinases. Um, so much as the fact that they're tyrosine kinases, but this isn't cell biology, this is immunology, where we're focusing on bigger pictures than just the cells here, all right? So this uh, phosphorylation series and, and, and binding of, of back and forth is, is kind of mirroring what we saw with ZAP70 and LCK. But the thing that I really want to stress here is the second step. So the second step, however, can be different. It doesn't have to all be the same thing. It can be really strong in one area or it can be kind of interspersed throughout. But for the first step, we have to have this clustering and cross-linking happening. So one of the most common ways we do this is by the use of the B-cell co-receptor to enhance the signal strength that we had from the clustering. And this consists of three parts, CD81, complement receptor 2, and then CD19. And uh, CD81 plays a role predominantly in transport and f actually guiding the co-receptor to the membrane. CR2 interacts with complement, as you can imagine. And then CD19 has this long, like, cytoplasmic chain that plays a role in signaling. But it's not just the B-cell co-receptor. Sometimes we have pattern recognition receptors, which there's no pictures on this or slides in, in this chapter about this. But just know that, like, toll-like receptors and other things, those can play roles in it. And then most importantly and, and predominantly, T-cell help plays a huge role in B-cell activation, right? So complement receptor 1, uh, also on the B-cell, plays a role in, in the whole process of cleaving the complement fragments into CD3 delta, or C3 delta, sorry. And this is the ligand for complement receptor 2. Why do we do this, though? So that we can actually have signals from the B-cell co-receptor in the, this kind of in this, uh, I guess, oriented into the close proximity of the B-cell itself, because the signal chain here on CD19 is going to be phosphorylated by one of those tyrosine kinases that I just talked to you about. And this increases the strength of the signal through presumably some type of a signal transduction pathway in a second messenger. The book didn't mention it. I just wanted to show this picture because it shows the fact that it doesn't have to necessarily be a pathogen-associated molecular pattern of a bacterial cell. It can be any type of a soluble toxin or, or piece of venom or, or in some context, uh, you know, penicillin <laughs> um, that's flagged with complement that can result in this reaction taking place here. So the binding of the complement receptor 2 to its ligand causes the co-receptor to complex with the B-cell receptor, right? This is what we're seeing here. Um, CD19 more so than CD81, but CD81, I guess, to a lesser extent, is going to transmit the signals from CR2, and in doing so, it's going to be phosphorylated by one of those tyrosine kinases um, to ultimately increase the signal strength up to 10,000 times stronger than what we had. So we're getting a very sensitive reaction to a very small amount of, of antigen. However, not all um, antigens require this. Not all pathogen-associated molecular patterns require this. Anything that's highly repetitive, protein or carbohydrate epitopes, can do this. And the reason that we do this is because if it's highly repetitive, obviously we're going to have a lot of cross-linking, a lot of clustering of B-cell receptors into the immediate area. And the reason that we can do this is usually with the B1 or CD5 positive B-cells to give us a very fast, high uh, quantity, but very low quality antibody response. This is an immediate thing that's happening very quickly before we have any type of the specificity that we usually get with the whole affinity maturation and other stuff that we've already talked about. So for, and this is, now we're kind of switching gears in this slide to the whole T-dependent activation, but follicular dendritic cells and the lymph nodes are kind of this unique subclass of dendritic cells that actually aren't 
really from hematopoietic origins, but more like that from fibroblasts in the bone marrow. And these guys here, besides from being dendritic cells with long, you know, dendritic morphologies, have complement receptors one and two. And the advantages of the having one and two, specifically two, is the fact that, like I had just shown you, uh, CR2 has this long, flexible stalk that basically makes it, and I literally call it this, antigen fishing so that it can go and it can bind to uh, totally intact antigens. So we're talking about intact B cell antigens that can just stay, stay there in, in this area of the lymph node for up to many, many years for activating with the B cells, right? And for some reason, I didn't change this, I meant to. CD35 is complement receptor one and CD21 is complement receptor two. Everything has like three or four different names based off of the discovery and then other names based off of the function of what it does. It's not just the follicular dendritic cells that are involved in this whole antigen fishing thing for presenting intact antigens to B cells. Um, Subsapular sinus macrophages also are, for the purposes of this, basically just smaller version of follicular dendritic cells, right? Um, they reside in the subscapula of the lymph node, as, as illustrated here. Both of these guys, both the follicular dendritic cells and the subscapular sinus macrophages have limited phagocytic ability. Why? Because B cells don't need that, right? B cells need a totally intact antigen to interact with. So yeah, CR1, CR2, that's increasing their ability to do this whole antigen fishing process there. And so when a B cell is going to interact with a T cell, it usually does this through a linked recognition. This is called cognitive interaction between a T follicular cell and an antigen activated B cell. Just like all other helper cells, T follicular helper cells are going to immediately, upon interacting with the MHC complex here, induce expression of cytokines and they make those cytokines on the spot. The most important ones that I think you need to know would be CD40 ligand because that's what makes the B cell more receptive to soluble cytokines and the soluble cytokine that you really need to know is interleukin-4. This is secreted by the T follicular helper Cell. One of the other things that you also <clears throat> may want to take note is that we always have an ICAM interacting with an LFA1 to make sure that whenever we are, that we're holding onto that B cell so that it stays in close proximity to actually receive the cytokines that we're going to be the ones that are soluble. So naive B cell activation requires both the antigen and the T cell help. B cell receptor has two distinct roles in this activation. It's going to send the activation signal to the nucleus for the signal transduction pathway and all the things that we'd already talked about. But T follicular helper cell activation is that B cells are going to undergo receptor mediated into cytosis and processing and presentation for the MHC type 2 pathway, which kind of activates the helper T cell to do his thing. And the specific mechanism for this, in, in my opinion, this mirrors CD8, but it's the same thing. All helper T cells do the same mechanism, right? We have an LFA ICAM interaction holding the target cell in close proximity. We have MHC type 2 interaction in this context with that, and that's the CD40 receptor there. And so once it binds there, once it recognizes the peptide MHC complex on the B cell, it's going to interact with by secreting cytokines, one of them being the CD40 ligand, and then ultimately delivering interleukin-4 or interleukin-10 or whatever specific cytokine we need at the time. Now, one of the ways that we discovered this was by staining of the cytoskeleton protein known as talon, but just like before with the CD8 cytotoxic T cell, all T helper T cells do the same thing. Once they're activated, they immediately start synthesizing the cytokines that they need, and they orchestrate everything, moving the microtubule organizing center, moving the Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, secretory vesicles, all into the appropriate proximity to deliver their payload accurately and effectively one cell at a time. I'm just going to denote this as the primary signal is the B cell receptor. B cell receptor consists of the Ig alpha and beta and then actual B cell receptor clustering or cross-linking, whatever you want to call it. So for the Ig alpha and beta, these guys contain their own ITAM regions, which these ITAMs are going to be phosphorylated by uh, tyrosine kinases in a very similar mechanism to what we saw with LCK, ZAP70, and all that jazz. Other factors that I wanted to mention would be that we also have pattern recognition receptors with B-cell activation, usually like a toll-like receptors, and then we just have other help. I'm just gonna say helper Cs for helper cells. Usually T-cells, but not always. There's a lot of new research being done on that. So this stands for B-cell co-receptor. It's made up of three parts, and I'm not giving those in um, structural order here. I'm just giving them an orientation so that the map will fit better. Uh, CD19, CD81, and then complement receptor 2. So as I had previously mentioned in um, the parts of the video, CD19 contains a signal chain that's going to act with the tyrosine kinase and ITAMs to form a very strong signal transduction pathway. CD81 is just involved in the B-cell co-receptor transport to the membrane. The only things I want to say about CR2 is that it has a very long and flexible stalk. And uh, CR complement receptor 2 binds to C3 delta. C3 delta resulted from this complement receptor 1. So let's just briefly talk about the T independent B cell activation mechanism. Um, all that I want to say about this is that this is really fast 
Um, we tend to be using the B1 cells, and um, uh, it's really just only IgM only, and it's very, I guess, like I said, uh, very high in quantity but low in quality. For the T-dependent B cell activation, um, there's three parts of this. We have the follicular dendritic cells, the subscapular sinus macrophages, and then the T-follicular helper cells, and I hope I have room to fit all that. Some things I want to say about follicular dendritic cells is the fact that they, um, they derive from fibroblasts in the bone marrow. They make very specific amounts of cytokines that play roles in ultimately B cell activation, but they also play a role in uh, antigen presentation. So what type of cytokines do they secrete? Well, they actually secrete a lot of them. Interleukin-6, 15, BAF, and 8D6. So what all these guys collectively come to do is they come to play a role in B cells, um, ultimately dividing and differentiating into centroblasts, which we'll talk about what that means in another video. My handwriting is getting horrible. That's subscapular. The subscapular sinus macrophages. So both the subscapular sinus macrophages and the follicular dendritic cells play a role in presenting fully intact antigens to B cells. And the way that we were able to do this is one, by the fact that we're not phagocytic, but two, we have a lot of, we're not phagocytic, we have complement receptor one, and we have complement receptor two with that long flexible stalk to do um, antigen fishing. So this is getting really ugly, but the next one that I wanted to mention would be T follicular helper cells. And all that I wanted to mention with these guys would be their cell adhesion molecules and their uh, cytokines. So what type of cell adhesion molecules does a T follicular cell have? Well they have LFA1 and that's going to interact with the ICAM on the B cell. Especially after binding to the CD40 ligand is going to increase its production of NF kappa B, which increases the bond strength between the two. The CD40 ligand produced by the T follicular helper cell, when it binds to its receptor site on the B cell, that's going to result in NF kappa B being released in the B cell, which is going to make this interaction here to have stronger bonding between the two. They're going to grab really tightly because it's about to receive soluble cytokines and it doesn't want it to go anywhere. So what are these said cytokines that I just mentioned? One of them is a CD40 ligand. We've already kind of talked about that. The other ones are interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-6, and just generally what I would consider to be others. Probably should have mentioned 10 as well, but oh well, I'll mention that in, I guess, other details. So what do all these guys do? Well, all of these guys play a role in differentiating B cells to centroblasts or plasma cells. So these are all the players of the cytokines that play a role in differentiating B cells into centroblasts and ultimately into memory and plasma cells. These are the players that we have for B cell activation. In the next video, I'm going to be talking about the roles that they play, not just in terms of the reactions, but in terms of location, 